Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walcha, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media in life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy. We learn through lessons and stories. Very excited about today's guest. We have the CEO of Brewpoint Coffee, Melissa Villanueva. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. I'm very excited to be here. So we uh, were so fortunate that Toast, our title sponsor of the show, that they believe in what we believe, which is smartphone storytelling. As small business owners, we have the opportunity to share our stories to a global audience if we're willing to have the courage to use that smartphone in our pocket to share our story. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about your story. Before we get into it, I'm going to ask you our favorite random question to start the show. So where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Oh my gosh, uh, that is a very interesting question because I'm going to show my cards that I don't go to shows that often. <laughs> <laughs> too busy working? Um, I mean, uh, the last shows, yeah, too busy working, but also like big crowds. I, I'm more of a home buddy than I think anyone yep. like, know based on my personality, but I would say the one that I've gone to a bunch is for Bears games with my husband. Okay, there you <laughs> so go. Soldier Field uh, is that's a stadium, right? That absolutely, counts. absolutely. Oh. Soldier Field is <laughs> one of the one of the greatest stadiums in the world. Well, there we go. Then I guess to have a not bad answer. So yeah, yeah. no Soldier Field. Beautiful. So we're going to go to Soldier Field. I'm going to convince Entrepreneur. I'm going to convince Toast um, to put together the greatest hospitality conference it's ever been. And I'm not talking about hospitality conference where there's presentations and PowerPoint slides. I'm talking about rock stars that are coming to bring the best information that they have. So all of this entire stadium is full with hospitality professionals, people that listen to this show, people that are out there really grinding and really trying to level up in their business. So I'm gonna bring you to center field and I'm gonna give you two minutes to let me know what is Brewpoint Coffee, where did it begin, and who are you? I love that. So have you ever looked on Craigslist for an espresso machine only to buy a coffee shop instead? Because <laughs> that is the story of Brewpoint Coffee. And yes, it's as wild as it sounds. Um, so uh, I met my um, husband. Um, and one of the first things he said to me is, sounds like you're ready to pull the trigger on the next thing for you in terms of career. And so I took that as my sign to quit my job, do a self-discovery trip and figure out what I want to do with my life while I was out in the Philippines doing the self-discovery trip, ended up, you know, dreaming about opening a coffee shop someday. Cause it's a great way to, um, it's a great way to build up community, um, ended up coming back from the Philippines, found this coffee shop on Craigslist, ended up buying it with, within a month with no idea what we were doing. Um, we started it together as boyfriend and girlfriend. And, um, that was eight years ago. Now we have four coffee shops, a coffee roastery an event space. I'm the co-author of a book called Starting Running a Coffee Shop, and I'm really big on local and global impact through my platform. So that's Melissa, a you story. absolutely crushed it. And I hope anybody that was listening, one of the things that we teach is how important it is as business owners. We forget to do our two minute drill. We forget our elevator pitch. Sometimes we get so in the weeds that we forget that we need to always know who we are and what we do so that our story can go on to more people. You never know what other opportunities are going to be out there, especially with all the different platforms that we have. So phenomenal job. Thank you for setting the stage. Soldier Field is going wild. We can't wait to get into it and to start right. to learn more. But take us to, because we have a lot of people that listen from all over the world. We're very fortunate. A lot of small business owners, a lot of restaurant owners, multi-unit restaurant owners. But tell us about what it is to go from owning one coffee shop to building a coffee company. That is a great question. So yeah, when we started our original coffee shop, we didn't even have a business plan. We were really super scrappy um, and we're dedicated to getting a little bit better every single day. But when I went from one coffee shop to a coffee company, it really at the core of it was because I had amazing staff that I wanted to see if they could have a career in coffee with, but it would be really hard if we only had one coffee shop. And so I started dreaming about, okay, let's have a second space. And can the second space be a place that we roast coffee and we have, you know, a second cafe within this, we could have enough cash flow to justify higher wages, to be able to, you know, have career 
career coffee um, people in our in our line of work. And so that was the, the heart of it. Um, and when we got a $75,000 um, to fund our grant from our city, that was really what propelled us to go from one shop to multiple. And I would say that going from one shop to multiple was probably the hardest thing, aside from maybe the pandemic. Um, uh, that Brewpoint has done. Um, we ended up doing two cafes within a year period because our library cafe opened um, yes. up as an opportunity. And I was really hesitant to do that because just bandwidth wise was like, why would I open another cafe in the middle of building out, you know, a big one. Um, but that cafe ended up being a huge cash flow um, opportunity that helped fund the uh, bigger space that we were renovating. Wow. So we ended up renovating a 4,000 square foot loading dock. Actually, the photo right behind me is <laughs> the space. Um, and we turned it into a cafe, roastery, event space that ended up being more of our um, our flagship location to showcase what we can really do as a coffee company. So, what made you think you could turn a loading dock into really the, the hub of what you're trying to build with this coffee company? Yeah, so... <laughs> It's interesting because I'm eight years in the business now and I'm realizing that a part of the re like part of what makes me successful, especially in the beginning was how delusional I was. Just <laughs> <laughs> like it was constantly this like, oh yeah, like we can figure this out. We can do it. And then it ends up being extremely difficult, but it is one of those things where it's like, you know, you shoot for the moon, you land in the stars or whatever that kind of analogy yep. is like. Yep we're way bigger and more successful as a company because of my delusion. I think we're also, you know, like I'm maybe a little bit more stressed or my husband is um, because of the things we aimed for, but I don't think we would do anything different. And so the, uh, the loading dock was because high ceilings, there was the ability for a garage. Um, it could be really unique. And honestly, on a, um, on a like expense standpoint, I knew that I could get good funding from the city, good funding from the landlord and get a really low rent from the space. And so economically speaking, it just seems like a really good idea. So what I love when I, when I was doing my background on you is, was how much you realize funds that typical entrepreneurs, we often ignore these mm -hmm. partnerships that you have with your local community, these grants that you applied for. Can you talk about the process of how did you find out about that? And then what did you do to execute to actually get it? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So let me just start off with kind of like the very beginning of Brewpoint in terms of funding. So we, um, I didn't, <laughs> I had been unemployed for two months by the time that I um, started Brewpoint. And so I had no uh, extra funds. My boyfriend, um, now husband, had a little nest egg that he was saving for a house someday. And he gave that to me to open Brewpoint. Wow. Um, yes, we were like seven months dating when he did that. I would not necessarily <laughs> recommend it. It worked out for us. I essentially said, that's my engagement ring. We're fine. Um, and then engagement well, through coffee. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah, how often do people give coffee shops as an engagement? Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, um, and then we got a little bit of funding from both our parents and we, that's how we started our first cafe from there. Um, the bigger location, it really was a matter of, I knew that if I wanted to grow my business, I would either need partners, investors, or loans. And unfortunately, I didn't have access to loans, even within two years of my business, yep. I would need to build out that second location. So I knew I had to do it in a different way. Um, at that point, I think I was open to investors or things of that sort. But if I could get it, in a different way without giving up ownership that seemed a lot more appealing and you know once you start asking and seeing what other opportunities are out there um there it, it doesn't hurt to ask so the city of elmhurst you know they had a tiff um fund that they hadn't given given to a small business before but based on the cloud that we'd already built in their in our community they were open to it and so we pitched that we got that that funding within three months had wow. to negotiate with our landlord, ended up getting an additional $60,000 in tenant improvement funds because his space wasn't rentable, really. It was just a storage unit, essentially, or a truck dock that wasn't making additional revenue. So he saw the return on that if we were in this space. And then from there, I was able to get just a little bit extra SBA funding. And that's what got us to our next stage 
as a business. And so that's, I mean, that's what laid the groundwork for how I think about funding. And then ever since the pandemic, you know, there's, there's the PPP funds, let alone um, grants that have opened up since then for small businesses has really remade how I think about funding um, my growth. Can you talk a little bit? It's something that we say on this show all the time. It's it's something my grandfather taught me. It's to stay curious, to get involved, to ask for help. The thing about asking for help was very difficult for me. We've been in business for 15 years, building barbecue restaurants, and only until recently have I really leaned into that principle. And I don't know if that's because I'm a man and I think that I can just do it myself. Can, can you bring me back? Where, where did you learn how to ask for help? That is a very interesting question. So how did I learn to ask for help? So one thing I'll say is that I was actually a philosophy major in college. So <laughs> wow, the, there we yeah. go. Now we're getting deep. I like it. Yeah, like asking questions was never really anything that like I shocked me. I'm like I was constantly asking why as a kid like I didn't understand how how like why things worked the way they worked and so asking questions I think was just an inher uh, inherent to who I was and am um and there's a part of me that's curious if I went to business school how different I would be as an entrepreneur versus a philosophy major right because yes um, there's a part of me that's really grateful that I didn't have any per like perceived notion of what being an entrepreneur looked like. Because honestly, I think it might have scared me away in not knowing anything and kind of just starting from scratch, scratch and, and being like, well, what makes sense to me and what makes sense for what I want and the values that I have? Because uh, my... I, the, my problem, I guess, when I was in the corporate world was I would keep asking questions of like, why do things have to function this way? We're saying that we have these values. Does it line up in terms of how our structure works? And like, I think that I saw the world in a lot of black and white back then. And now that, that I'm an entrepreneur, I still have my ideals, but I have a lot more of an idea of like, you know, what I might have to compromise to get there or what I might have to do to get there, like what kind of hustle I need to do. Um, and so... Yeah, it is asking, asking for help, asking questions. I think that it's always been inherent to me. I think as I become more experienced, I, I have to relearn how to ask questions because I keep thinking I know what I'm doing. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that it's only beneficial to be in a stance of like humility and just like, well, what do I not know? And what can I additionally learn from anyone around me? Yeah, I think the advantage of being an entrepreneur, it's when you actually take that that plan and you do jump off the cliff and you do decide to open up that business, that you start to build this momentum. So once you opened up the second and the third store, I'm sure you're starting to get more and more requests for more things. How do you delineate between what your core building and when to say yes and when to say no? Uh, that. Another great question. So I have been much more of like the visionary of the company, um, you know, founder, owner, CEO, and I've intentionally put everyone around me to be much more detail oriented than I am. Yes. <laughs> so in a lot of ways, I've been the gas and everyone around me is the brakes. And <laughs> <laughs> that is very well, very well put, very yeah. well put. And it is I've come to really, really respect people who just, you know, have more of those like attention to detail type of way of thinking, because, you know, I am very proud of what we've built over the past eight years, but I know that if I, you know, especially at this point, any large risk I take has the ability to be a liability for the rest of my business. So I am much more apt at this point to dream big bring it to my team, say, is this something that we can do? How much of a new system do we have to build versus utilizing systems we already have? And know that if I say yes to something, it might mean say no to something else. And so we just become a lot more strategic in what we say yes to or no to. And um, I think I've been really relying a lot more on systems than just kind of like one shot opportunities as much as possible. So cafes and everything within our like e-commerce roastery is the things I mostly will say yes to. 
I love you. You just tapped on something that's a, a nerve for this show, and that's that's e-commerce. Thinking differently as restaurants, as coffee shops, as smoothie shops, whatever we're selling in food, we have the ability to sell to a global audience. We have the technology that helps us serve a global audience, and we can start to look at these standard business P and Ls in a much different way when we deal with packaging that's sustainable that we can deliver. You know, we don't have to go and create Gold Belly. We don't have to go and create you know Shopify. All of these places, Toast is our primary point of sale system. They know that I lean on them to, to figure out, hey, how can I start selling ribs on TikTok? Because those are things that we're interested in to make something that, of a huge impact on this industry. Can you talk about why e-commerce is so important for the coffee business? Yeah. So there's a couple different things. I think that though cafes are my bread and butter and I love like the space it creates and the impact it can have on the local community cafes and its own like profit margins i mean the same thing for i think just the general restaurant industry yep. it's it's a hard thing to scale and have livable wages especially with how yep. wages have grown recently and when i look at specialty coffee specifically and how our crops and our just larger supply chain is just it's going to be ravaged in the next couple of years we have to be really mindful of how many people we have in the supply chain and you know how can we make sure that farmers stay in the market all that being said i i'm in a mindset of i do think that e-commerce and b2b and scaling nationally is the way in which i can make a huge impact in my ecosystem so i can afford better wages across the board that i can make sure that i'm paying my farmers what they need in order to stay coffee farmers yeah. um and so yeah e-commerce has been actually the biggest thing that in the past i would say a couple months i've been investing a lot of time and energy to get really good at so i've been in the mindset of when i first started brewpoint in that first cafe of just assuming i don't know anything diving into it and learning as much as possible of learning the system and systems like shopify or toast or whoever else like that it's all like it's it's learnable right like yep. we can learn these things we can get good at these things especially if you've proven that you've been able to get good at what you do you can trust and believe that you can get good at e-commerce and yes. so that has been my approach recently and i've already started seeing um at least like a 30 percent uptick in the past month after focusing on it for two months and so I feel really good about how it's growing and what it's looking like there have been you know mistakes along the way but I think not beating up yourself after you make a mistake and just getting back into the system, trying to get better in terms of making your e-commerce site really um, flexible and also seamless. That has been my like attention for the past two months. What can a local coffee company learn from Starbucks? Ooh, a lot. <laughs> so I have not shied away from putting my cafes near Starbucks's because Ooh. I, it'll, the thing is, is that they have done the market research, spent, you know, tens, hundreds, I don't, know, I don't know how much money, but they've spent, you know, thousands of dollars on knowing what locations are their best for sure. the cafe. So one thing for me is just like, if there's a Starbucks, I know it's a place that my cafe can do well. Um, and then we just have to differentiate ourselves a little bit. And so that is one thing that I take from Starbucks on a regular basis is just like, okay, wh what locations do you think cafes are needed and that will do well? And so that's the first thing that I look at. Other than that, I think that efficiency, I mean, it's, that's, that's, they're really good at efficiency and it's hard because I am in specialty coffee, which means that there's a little bit more of an attention to how the espresso works and how, you know, our coffee is just generally speaking. So we're not going to be as fast. I'm, I'm less apt to want to do drive-throughs because I really want that, that community connection feel and space does that. Um, but all those things differentiate us. Right. And so, yeah, I, I, I look at first as location from Starbucks. How do you sell food? Yes, we, well, we sell like pastries and things okay. of that sort. And then some of my locations do charcuterie and cocktails. So that's a little bit of. So I, I would love to know at what point for a coffee shop does too much food, because when I look at Starbucks and see what they're doing now versus what they did in the past, 
I look at them more as a restaurant than I do a coffee shop. The amount of menu items that they have. And one of the things that we've learned in 15 years of running a barbecue business, we were a breakfast restaurant, a lunch, a dinner, and a sports bar. And eventually we added barbecue and focused on barbecue. We had to get rid of things in order to really do what we do best. At what point do you go, we should add something as in food or as in a menu item, or should we focus on coffee? Yeah. So I would say that we, we also do a lot and some of our locations do more than others. And ironically, the one that is most coffee centered is the one that is the highest profitable location. And so all that being said, it, there's also a difference between like the workload of something, right? Yep. So, yep. you know, adding pastries totally makes sense for every single cafe. Um, but the moment that I'm adding things that my staff have to be good that is, you know, additional training, additional labor, uh, you know, it's, it's a whole other game. And it's one thing to outsource something versus doing it yourself. So for instance, like, it's the same question of should you roast your own coffee as a coffee shop? Or should you, you know, should you have a roaster partner? Should you do your own food program? Or should you just get deliveries of like, you know, grab and go foods um, that you don't have to prep or do additional work on. And so I do think for me, the first question is how much labor am I adding to something? How much expertise do I have to add in, you know, adding another layer? Or am I just outsourcing something and bringing it on a regular basis? Um, because that's a lot less work. And so I, that I could just focus even more on my craft. So for us, we focus mostly on the roastery. So that has been like our level of, you know, it's like equivalent to a kitchen in the sense of like making sure you have the right recipes and yep. it's the right quality. And, you know, I, what I love about focusing more on a roastery, coffee roastery than a food program is that that's my ability to scale up with e-commerce. Are there any local coffee companies or any ones that you follow nationwide that do a good job of, uh, of building what, what you're looking to build oh. that you admire? Yeah, well, this is actually not a coffee company, but it's it's something that I've been thinking about lately. And I don't know how they're we're different in some values, but one or, uh, organization that I've been really fascinated by has been um, the Fixer Upper couple from Waco, Texas. Okay, uh, I don't know them. <laughs> uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines, they're they're like they're, they're pretty big. Um, they're like huge in their area, and they okay. The reason why I been really intrigued by them is because they're both hyper local and hyper national. I mean, really pro probably global based on how, who they are, but yep. they have this like HGTV show okay. where they like fix up homes and they're like the super cute couple doing cute things. Um, but they've made this like small town of Waco, Texas, a destination location nationwide. And they have multiple types of businesses that have really created amazing economic development for their town. And for me, that's, that's like true local impact and true national global impact. And mm -hmm. how can I do both, right? Like I, if I scale, there's always this feeling of like, does my business lose its soul to some degree? Yep. Um, and that's been my mindset is just like, I want to remain hyper local. I want my community to know me and know my business and feel like, you know, we have this like true neighborly connection. Mm -hmm. But how do I do that while also wanting to grow and scale my business and be nationally recognized? And so for me, they've done like a true, like truly good job at that, that I tend to look at on a like more emotional basis, I think. Do they do it through content? Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, they're on TV, so the, <laughs> that's huge. But right? also on social media as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're everything. I mean, I see them on magazines on a regular basis and whatnot. And so they're, I think they're just iconic in who they are as a couple. And I think that's a big piece of who they are. And then just their, their complementing strengths. And I, I think that like, they really show like the behind the scenes. And so they can actually transfer what they do into a lot of different types of businesses. Cause I'm pretty sure they have like a bakery. It's like Magnolia Bakery in um, Waco, Texas. So they, they have things that are totally outside of what they do because of the brand of who they are. So what is the secret? I know you wrote a book on how to start a coffee shop, but what's the secret to opening up a coffee shop for somebody that's listening, that's inspired yeah. to, well, I guess not Maybe Craigslist. I guess Craigslist is still a thing in 2022, but maybe they're they're inspired by this show and they're they're thinking, well, maybe 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 this is what I wanted to do. What's the secret to opening up a coffee shop? 
uh, especially your first one, right? Because it's your first one. Yeah. As you evolve, but for me, it's it's about knowing the right opportunity because I think that in being someone who has talked to a lot of people who have been interested in opening coffee shops, they have this vision of what it looks like and what it like where it'll be, and you know that it, they want it to be perfect. Um, but for me, it really is. It is, it's, it's the opportunity in front of you, right? So the fact that I found something on Craigslist that it was kind of a crazy good location. Um, it was right next to a train station, a university in the middle of a downtown of a, you know, a small or medium-sized town near Chicago. Um, and the original owners of the coffee shop spent $100,000 in renovations for it. Someone wow. bought it a year later for 50,000 and then we bought it for 36,000. Amazing. Uh, it's, it was just one of those things where it's like, yeah. I don't know why this location hasn't worked, but I don't think it's because of the location. And now I'm getting in at 36,000 instead of a hundred thousand, like I'll, we'll be able to recoup that. Um, that is to me, the opportunity that has essentially been the diving board for everything else. So, yeah. Can you talk about your core values and why, why is that so important that you put them on your website? And as I mean, eight years might seem like forever, but it's still, you're still a young company and to, mm -hmm. to lead with core values, um, to talk about them and all the content that you put out there. Why is that so important? And what are they? Yeah. So you're asking an interesting question at question at an interesting time, because I do feel like we are evolving a little bit in terms of our values. I think a lot of people have changed over the pandemic and, my the values for my company are very similar to the values that I hold um, as like a human being, and so the ones that we focused on the past tend to be more around kindness, thoughtfulness, respect, engagement, diversity, growth, which are all things that are really important to me as a human being and as like as you can see through Brewpoint. At this point, what I've been thinking a lot about is our platform and our ecosystem, and if I was to say. If there was two words I would want my ecosystem to be defined by, it's it's a system that is equitable and a, a system that's inclusive. And so at this point, like I'm I'm really grateful that we're in a stable enough place that I can focus inward in my at my structure and be able to ask the questions of does my structure reflect the things I want to see in the world? And if it doesn't, how can I get it there? And so yeah, it looks like, you know, hiring practices and it looks like, you know, not just looking internal at my team, but also looking at who are our vendors, who are our farmers, how are they doing? Am I building an authentic relationship with them? And am I really trying to put them um, as priority alongside of my business as we build something really unique together? And so that is, that's like at the core of like who we are. And I will say that like, I've been trying to think about for myself, like what really motivates me, because in some ways I'm super goal oriented, in some ways I'm not. And I, um, I think I'm, I think really at the, at the end of the day, when I think about what makes me most proud of Brewpoint, it's when I walk into a cafe and I'm talking to a staff member who I probably don't know that well at this point, because I have about 35 to 40 employees. Um, and they just out, go out of their way to tell me that this is one of their favorite places that they've worked at. And like every single time that happens, I'm always not surprised, but kind of like, I'm not expecting it. And it's just one of the most fulfilling things. Like to me, that that's the thing that makes me know I'm doing a good job and that we're doing a good job. And so, yeah, the culture of my company and the values that we hold really are the thing that like keeps me going and keeps me trying to get better. Why is it important as a woman and a minority to be as vocal as you are on as many platforms as you are and to go to as many stages as you are to talk about what you're building? Thank you for asking that. It is, it is both incredibly important and also it is a little terrifying sometimes. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate you asking that question. I, I applaud you for doing it. And the, the more that I research what you're doing, um, the more that it, it's, it needs to be done more but please tell me, tell me what inspires you to do it. Yeah. So it, it is something that it was an intentional decision in the beginning of Brewpoint was, you know, I own my company hundred percent outright. How much do I put my face in front of this company to a point where people associate, you know, Melissa Villanueva and Brewpoint at the same time. Um, and in some ways, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it too much at first. I, 
you know, just as much as any entrepreneur, I like attention to some degree, but as time has gone on, it, it has been more and more this intentional decision of, I want people who look like me and to know that they can do this, that they can be entrepreneurs, they can be CEOs, they can build things that don't have to compromise on the core values of who you are in the world you want to see. And so, and you can do it with while also 100% owning your company, right? Even if you don't have a ton of resources yourself. And so for me, it has been this, like, every time I do it, it is this intentionality of, it is not really about me. Um, it is about uh, impacting, you know, like little girls like me or people who feel like they aren't the typical CEO looking person, um, that they can, you know, they can be delusional and do things that like most people who are experienced to be like that, what are you doing? And you can aim for something and end up hitting something much bigger. And so the representation piece is really important to me. I, I think it's also something that is, you know, uh, it's attracted a lot of people to my team who have similar values. And that has been incredibly important and to maintaining the culture that I feel really proud of. Um, and so, yeah, all that being said, I, if I think about like removing myself as like the face of the company, it is a little hard because it is, it is the soul of the company that I like really want to keep cultivating. And it doesn't have to look exactly like me, especially as time goes on, but I want it to still it feel human, right? Like I don't want it to feel too corporate, not necessarily that's a bad thing, but I want it to have elements that feel human. And so, yeah, I, I really appreciate that question. So I've, I was recently on TikTok looking at a piece of content and it was about business owners and CEOs in Japan and about long-term business planning and short-term business planning. Okay. And in Japan, a short-term business plan is 20 years, Ooh. completely different to how we think about business here in the United States. I'd love for you to be delusional. I'd love for you to shoot for the moon and to give us what's the vision for 20 years. When you look back, the beautiful thing about content, this will live on the internet forever, entrepreneur.com. You'll be able to go back and say, I can't believe that, that I, I short-sighted it, you know, be delusional. Tell us what, what is, uh, what's going to happen for Brewpoint Coffee 20 years from now. So pie in the sky, but also obtainable um, dream for Brewpoint in the next 20 years. So I would love to have a coffee manufacturing business that focused on building up other people of color in our industry. So if we have a space where we can help you roast, we can help you package, we can have, help you distribute and really build into having more people of color in our industry doing things at a high level, that is what I want to build out. I want to be able to be the core operations for that. Um, I would love for it to be in Chicago and I would love to see possibly multiple um, re iterations of that. And so in my mind, like the reason I've been able to own my company 100% outright is because of collaborations with other organizations that have broadened my community and broadened my network. And so the more that we can collaborate with other like-minded businesses, whether they're further along from us, they're bigger than us, whether they're smaller than us, whether they're new, the more that we can all learn from each other and we can collaborate together, the sky's the limit for us, right? Like then we can actually be delusional and achieve it. Yeah. And so that is, that's where my head is at right now. And I think that's where we'll be going as a company. I think that there's a possibility of things like franchising my business or having multiple cafes, but in the spirit of kind of being true to where I'm at and where I can see the longevity of everything down the line from being able to really impact coffee farmers, being able to have um, a huge impact in the US in terms of having more people of color be coffee company owners, that is what I want to build out and be a part of. So I can see that being achievable within 10 years, let alone 20. So. There we go. I love it. Well, yeah, we believe a rising tide lifts all ships and anybody that's listening to this content, um, I am readily available, weirdly available. I stole that from Ryan Reynolds, but um, please reach out to me. It's at Sean P. Walchef on any platform, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. Um, we're going to put links to Brewpoint Coffee and how to get in touch with uh, Melissa. But one of the things that we do every week on Clubhouse, the audio app on Wednesday and Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 
time, we host a show that allows the listeners to come up on stage, no matter where you are in the world, share your story. And people that have supported this show, we like to do uh, social shout outs. This week, I have a very special shout out, um, and it goes to my best man, uh, Jack Harris. He actually was in the coffee business. He took the leap of faith and opened up a coffee shop here in San Diego, Blue Lagoon Coffee. Um, it, 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 he didn't make it, but he put his whole heart and soul into it. And, you know, one of the things as, as business owners, there's people that support us in our darkest days. And I know uh, Jack, my best man, he, when it's gotten tough for me in the barbecue and the media's times, um, he's always supported me and he, uh, he'll listen to this content. I just want him to know that I love him and I appreciate him. Uh, Melissa, I want you to, to who, who is somebody that that's in your corner that, that you di- don't get the opportunity to, to say thank you to that you can give them the big entrepreneur stage and let them know how much they mean to you. Hmm. So and just make sure I'm understanding, is it another entrepreneur from another business or anyone? It's, this is, this is a wide open blank slate, one shot, one opportunity. Yeah. I, I can't not say my husband, Angelo, <laughs> I, it's, I mean, let's, let's like walk through it. He like at seven months dating, he gave me all his funds to open a coffee shop. I remained a hundred percent owner and we got married. We got engaged two months into starting the business. And then four months after that, we got married. And we, like, I could not do this without him. He is literally like, I have my dreams and my aspirations and I say yes to things. And then he makes sure that they don't fail. And so <laughs> like, we have tried to not work together. I'm just like, oh, like maybe you should get another job so we can make more money. And every single time he comes back because we just love working together. And so I can't imagine doing Brewpoint without him. I can't imagine what like my life generally speaking would be without him because he always believes in me. Um, Even when I'm like, like, oh no, I'm just like a normal person who can achieve normal things. (laughs) Um, I think he's just like my biggest cheerleader. So I really appreciate that. So where, where can people buy your coffee? Where can they interact with you? Let, let everyone know. Yeah, so we are on brewpointcoffee.com. We have a great e-commerce website with some really interesting products that are beyond the not, like normal coffee. Um, uh, we have some infused coffees that are super unique. Um, it's uh, CBD hemp infused, and we're pretty new. Or like we're breaking kind of the industry right now in the Midwest. Very cool. So that's on brewpointcoffee.com, and we ship nationwide. If you are in the Chicagoland area, we have four cafes, three all in Elmhurst, um, a town of 40,000 people. And then we have one in Oak Park, which is a little bit closer to Chicago. So that's, and we're also on Instagram and on Facebook at Fruit Point Coffee. Awesome. Well, thank you, Melissa Villanueva, Chief Visionary Offer. Chief Visionary Officer, according to Simon Sinek, that's uh, that's what we like to say. But somebody that is uh, truly, truly doing the things that we hold so true on this show. Um, you're doing the work that is so admirable. We're so lucky to be connected. Um, anybody that's listening to the show, please reach out uh, if you have any questions about the coffee business. I know Melissa will be happy to answer them. And uh, if you have any questions for me, it's at Sean P. Walchef. As always, stay curious get involved and don't be afraid to ask for help. We will catch you guys next week. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. 
I will get you the link to the right toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about toast, you implemented toast, you did a toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your toast story with us. DM me today to learn more and be sure to check out toast.